thank you for taking time out from uh, your busy day and especially you know in this period which is leading up to the festive season. So we really appreciate uh, such a healthy turnout. And we're glad that no one uh, was I guess got lost from the last minute change in venue. And I I suppose no one came about uh, no one, I'm glad no one was uh, intimidated, I guess, uh, into not coming. Um, so, you know, welcome to this forum uh, titled Foreign Workers, Justice and Fairness, which is organized by Marua. Uh, I'm very, I think we're very privileged to have such a distinguished panel of speakers with us today. Uh, and, you know, I will speak, uh, I'll introduce them a little bit later. Uh, but before I, we really begin, uh, I think we need to thank all our partners and that there are some uh, partners who have really worked very hard together with Marua to put this together. Um, we would like to thank TWC2, uh, WorkFest Singapore, and Health Service. So I would like to, uh, my name is Kamal, uh, I'm chairing this uh, session, I'm the Vice President of Marua. Before we begin, uh, I want to just go through some ground rules. So firstly, just to let everyone know, uh, this event is Public. It is on record. It is being filmed by TOC, and I believe TOC will publish the video on YouTube. Um, there is press in the house, uh, at least three from SPH. I, I think the independent is here as well. Yes, so we are. Please, <laughs> please be prepared for uh, coverage if you do speak and participate. Uh, we will have a QA at the end of uh, after all the speakers have spoken. And when asking questions, it would really be helpful if you just introduce yourself a little bit so that we know where you're coming from uh, and you know, what you're speaking to. And a um, couple of uh, reminders. Firstly, please uh, switch off or put on silent your mobile phones and other meeting devices. And lastly, uh, I think here's a very important reminder, which is that there are ongoing court cases surrounding the migrant workers who were involved, who were allegedly involved in the riots a couple of weeks ago. And so please, um, I think everyone who decides to speak should be mindful and careful about their comments. And finally, of course, you know, just being Singapore, there's always an, uh, you should always be mindful about potential defamation risk and what I say. With that out of the way, <laughs> we, we're very privileged today to have uh, Mr. Russell Hay, who's the president of TWC2 on my right. Uh, Russell has been has been the president of TWC2 since, uh, since March 2011, and he joined TWC2 shortly after it was formed in 2003. He has since held the position of secretary, treasurer, and vice president. He has a PhD in political science from the Australian National University, and was a researcher at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies until his retirement in 2007. Prior to his academic career at IC, uh, Russell was the features editor at, at the Sunday Times in SPH. And he will be speaking on the reality of the lives of foreign workers in Singapore. Russell? Uh, sorry guys, you can hold the mic really close. How long do I have? Uh, I think on the program we've got like 15 minutes for each speaker. Alright, <laughs> thanks. It's more than Good evening everyone, thank you for coming. It's been a long day, I was at TWC today, and, and in an NGO, you really don't know what can happen, so uh, you just ride with, with, with whatever turns out at the doorway, and then it's a roller coaster. Uh, something like 15 workers came to launch a complaint, so glad to you. Um, right, um, let's start by just uh, talking a bit about TWC2, the work we do, and how is it related to to the issues that we are, we are here to, to discuss today. The TWC2 remit, our main mission, is to help workers with their employment-related problems. Uh, largely problems when they come here and they run into uh, a lousy employer, um, a, 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 rogue, uh, um, a, a rogue agent, get injured, nobody wants to pay for the medical treatment and so on, and we step in and, and try to resolve it for them. We, usually don't uh, deal with law and order issues pertaining to uh, foreign workers. Uh, if they are out there, they commit a crime or they get in some dispute with another person, that doesn't come into our, our, our reading. So basically, what happened in Little India on Sunday, two Sundays ago, uh, TWC2 wasn't there. Uh, 
from what we could see, none of the workers who have been locked by us as people we are helping are uh, involved in it. So basically, we are also looking at it as bystanders, learning as much as we can. Uh, and therefore, I really have no more knowledge of that event than every one of you out here today. Uh, I'm, reading, I'm reading what's on, on social media. I'm waiting for the police as they investigate to come up with more facts. I'm waiting for the court case. I'm also waiting for the COI to do a proper job and tell us what they have found in the investigation. Um, and um, it also, therefore, is my hope that uh, the COI, uh, Commission of Inquiry, inquiry uh, will take this opportunity to take a more holistic approach to this whole issue of workers uh, writing in the media, uh, and not just treat it as a purely law and order issue uh, of ascribing to blame and so on. And we should take this opportunity to look at uh, in Singapore how is our working environment and living conditions for a foreign worker and uh, what is it in there that may cause uh, a tendency to lead to events that we saw two Sundays ago. And therefore, in understanding these things better, uh, we can address these issues and therefore prevent a repetition of it. I think nobody wants to see that kind of thing happen again. Uh, Basically, my, my message is that we should really learn the right lessons from what happened quite independent and separately from how the courts are going to rule uh, in, the, in the days or the weeks to come. <coughs> uh, tonight's talk, I'm going to cover uh, my topic in two broad areas. One would be the workers we are helping who come to us for assistance. And this would be people who have got a, a dispute that they need to resolve. And it's a worker with a problem. And then beyond that, let's deal with the larger issue of just and the average foreign worker who really hasn't got a problem, who is going about his business day to day, uh, what sort of living conditions does he put up with? Okay, so these are, these are the two broad areas I want to cover. On the first part, which is about workers with a problem, TWC2 has quite a lot of experience now. I mean, uh, on the average, in the past three years, we've locked about more than 2,000 cases a year of workers with problems. Uh, I should also uh, add that uh, tonight when I talk about workers' problems, I just want to focus on the problems faced by South Asian male workers. Because foreign workers are broad spectrum, also foreign domestic workers and so on. But for tonight's conversation, of, uh, let's just deal with the problems faced by South Asian male workers on a work permit that have a low wage manual work. Uh, next. Uh, uh, The best way to, to look at uh, these male workers who come here and who then, who then come to us for assistance to so get uh, what, what is that journey, the first step of that journey that takes them to Singapore, which then potentially cause them a problem. Um, any foreign worker wanting to come to Singapore, uh, if he's allowed to land in Singapore, he needs something called an IPA, in principle approval that he has on. And um, the idea of an IPA also is that um, on that IPA, which is issued by the Minister of Manpower, would be written uh, his, the salary is meant to get in Singapore, the name of his employer, uh, and this would be both in the English language and in the vernacular of the country. He's from Bangladesh, uh, he would be written in Bengali, he's from, from, uh, from um, China, written Chinese. And uh, here comes the problem. Uh, we all know that foreign workers as a whole uh, is an underpaid group of people. Uh, and generally, the, the market reality there is that most of them would be paid $600 to $800 basic for doing hard manual labor. Now, most of us who say that's already goes underpaid. Uh, um, However, um, over the years, I have looked at IPA that always shocked me, and I was can this go any lower? So over the years, I have seen IPA that isn't 600 or 800, that's like 400. 
and, and then it just goes down. And uh, the last I have seen, the last IPA I have seen, the lowest in my record, is $220. And I'm sure in the weeks or months ahead, I probably will come across one that is below that. Uh, so, so can you imagine coming to Singapore uh, with a salary written on a piece of official document saying that you'll be paid $220 a month. I mean, can you possibly live from that? Oh, um, however, however, no law is broken here. The employer who is to, to agrees to, to apply for that permit has written down that salary. It's never broken no Singapore law. So the Singapore civil servant who issued it will also say that it's within our law to allow it because Singapore hasn't got a minimum wage law. So technically, you all can apply for a foreign worker if you have the quota given to you and just put five cents. And it will be legal. <coughs> and if the worker comes here and he runs into a problem, you pay five cents, he's not happy. Uh, it's your right to pay five cents. And, and so the Singapore law has a recourse for a worker like that who is exploited, no, we don't. Now, if that worker is very unhappy and he feels so exploited, he really can't live on the amount. What should he do? But in other countries, he may just out of sheer anger protest. For instance, outside the MOM and so on. But our laws have increasingly been tightened to make that impossible. It would be illegal for him to protest. So, therefore, our law, on the one hand, condones a kind of setup that is and, op and also obstruct people who want to try and do something to highlight their grievances. Uh, therefore, understand that the, the IPA system, which was crafted to, to make sure that uh, workers get the pay that they have promised, has got this great loophole in it because our law for inadequate. We don't have a minimum wage law, therefore allowing illegal exploitation. Now, let, let's say that uh, for a majority of IPAs issued in Singapore, uh, it's not that $220 situation, it's $600, $800. Now, we all think that that really is underpayment, but actually, the foreign workers are okay with it. Uh, they kind of think that, yeah, with that, it's a better deal than if they were to be at home uh, jobless. They come here, they work all the work time they can get, and they, they are satisfied or happy with what they're earning here. But <coughs> here is that, uh, here comes the second hurdle happens sometimes. You get an IPA with a salary that you are happy with, uh, and the, in the IPA you land in Singapore, only to find that your employer can then say, oh, uh, I, I really think I won't pay you uh, so much. It's a new contract. And the new contract comes with a new salary. Now, there's a term for this called contract, contract substitution. That really should not be the case. That, that by international law is, is not right. Uh, how does this pan out in the Singapore government position? And this is where, in our work in TWC2, we find that the, the approach for MOM officials to this is highly discretionary. Uh, depending on which desk officer uh, is, is handling this complaint by a worker, uh, sometimes it's not allowed, but sometimes the worker is kind of told that it's too bad, you know, if you don't like the new contract, you shouldn't have signed it, kind of situation. So uh, I want to make a point here that in, in, in helping the, the <coughs> workers that come to us, we find that Singapore law is sometimes adequate, uh, but uh, it is also, uh, it can be uh, quite inadequately enforced. There's a lack of transparency, and therefore this is an ongoing issue with the internal power ministry uh, to try and sort this out. Okay, I'll just, I'll just have one more. Uh, right. Um, for those who, who run into a situation like that, uh, a salary dispute, and they, and they come to us, and we find that uh, they have been grossly underpaid. Uh, but usually the experience is that that kind of underpayment doesn't, isn't just something that happened last month. It's not surprising to find that they have been underpaid for the past six months or the past one year even. So you can't ask yourself, why, why did it take so long to surface the issue? And that's it. Um, um, the, the Singapore system is such is that there's, no, there's a 
it's a lack of symmetry in power between employer and employee when it comes to the foreign worker. Uh, the foreign worker dare not complain because uh, his employer has the right to send him home without having to be given a proper reason. And the guy has paid lots of money to come here, uh, usually borrowing or, or, or pawning land that he has for sometimes eight to ten thousand just get that's just get a job in So for him in Singapore for the first one year, he's basically working off that debt. So for him it is critically important for him that he must stay on the job for as long as he can to, to clear that debt and to earn some money. Uh, so therefore this guy therefore takes the kind of bullying that he has put up with for as long as he can. So the little bullying that he get, you know, underpayment maybe for uh, half a bunch of salary, illegal deductions, uh, and things like that. He put up with it until he really cannot anymore. And then and that's when that's when he becomes a case <coughs> MOM. What I'm saying is that for all the cases that you get lodged as a complaint to MOM, out there, out there among the brown workers, there probably would be more cases that people don't have the, the courage or confidence to present. Um, this this brings uh, asked to a question of just how many, how many workers would have this kind of a problem. Um, I would I have to agree with the civil servants who say that only a minority of foreign workers have problems like that. Indeed, it should be a minority. If it is a majority, then my God, that there was just one large in everyone, everything. But, but let, let, me, let me give you, put the, let's put the figures in perspective and get a grip on what it means. No? One million foreign workers are low wage, all right? As a conservative estimate, let's say 1% of them meet with a rogue employer or a dishonest agent. 1% of 1 million is 10,000 workers. 10,000 workers will see with a serious problem like that. In TWC2, we deal with 2,000 a year, so another 8,000 is out there. <laughs> Maybe one of our sisters' organizations deals with it. But yeah, so when you, when, you, when you are told that oh, only a minority of foreign workers run into a problem like that, imagine. Uh, that this minority is not such a small number. It is an issue we really have to come to grips with. It is like it's like drunk driving. You know, drunk driving also is a very small minority of drivers who drink. Who drink, but it is really a serious problem. We have to devote resources to deal with it. Uh, very quickly now, since I'm being pressed for time, uh, there are other issues that they face, like uh, work injury and, and, and employers dragging their teeth and so on. Basically, again, it's the issue of the law. Some of them are not clear enough, and even if they are clear enough, uh, the manpower ministry can be quite lenient to employers who drag them. But let me just end up by just looking at the workers who don't complain, uh, the average worker out there who doesn't come to the notice. Uh, is this experience in Singapore an unhappy one? And this I have to say that uh, I have to base it on the workers who come to us with their complaint, right? Um, and basically their unhappiness with Singapore is very, it's very focused on the problems they have with a employer, an agent uh, who cheated them, or a civil servant in MOM who they feel is not helpful enough. Basically, we have never come across, or very seldom come across, a foreign worker who is who says that Singapore is a lousy place. They're actually quite happy here, uh, which, which, which probably tells us that by and large, um, Singaporeans do treat foreign workers okay, or at least uh, foreign workers are okay with us as a society. Once in a while, we have a community of people among us who don't show us at our best, like Serangoon and Garden people who don't want a dormitory uh, in their neighborhood. But I would say that by and large, from what we can gather from the foreign workers, <coughs> Uh, will be held. <coughs> Their complaint is not with Singapore society or will not have to do with life in general in Singapore. It is all these specific issues about inadequate laws and our bad enforcement of laws that cause them that problem and their unhappiness. Thank you. Thanks, Russell. Uh, and I think for, for many of us, none of what Russell says will be new, but for those of you who want to find out more, about the challenges faced by migrant workers in Singapore. You can definitely go to TWC2's website where you can find a lot more uh, material and information on all these issues faced by them. Our next speaker is Ms. Bremer Murphy. Bremer is the president of Marua, 
which hopefully does not need any introduction uh, because we are organizing this event. She is, uh, Raymond is the founder president of TWC2 and has, is a past president of Women's Group Aware and she has also been a vice president of uh, Action for AIDS. She is currently also, besides being the president of Meru, the regional president for Southeast Asia and Pacific for the International Council of Social Welfare. Uh, Raymond will be speaking on the topic of the riots, measures, and justice. Raymond. Thank you very much, John and Russell, and thank you uh, to everyone here. Uh, very good evening. Um, why did I give those titles for my description uh, or, or designations? Is because the International Council of Social Welfare which is an international NGO of which I am the regional president for Southeast Asia and the Pacific. There are many discussions going on at that level on the welfare of migrant workers and the second most important thing, the dignity of migrant workers. And I think if we are having all these discussions at that level, then all the more, I think, the scrutiny of what has happened in Singapore needs to be uh, tighter and, I, I think, deeper. I, in a paradoxical or ironical way, we also have to say that the riots, it's, um, it's a pity, but at the same time, it also gives us many moments of, for reflection and deepening our thoughts on what do we want better for this community as well as Singaporeans. Of course, I think on behalf of everyone here, we, are, um, we, we feel that the police officers, the SEDF officers, as well as the paramedical, they should not have been treated in this manner by anyone, and so uh, by the migrant workers, and all that damage is of course something that we will not uh, say it was a great thing, it is criminal, that is a given. However, one less known fact is that there were also migrant workers who will tell you stories of how they too had been injured or they had been cut by glass, etc. in the process. Whether they were active, or, uh, active participants or bystanders, these are some of the stories that the migrant worker, workers will tell you when you, you dwell in Little India and have chats with them. I just want to put that out there. I feel that this whole thing, uh, um, from what Russell has said, should make us angry. If it still doesn't make us angry, I think we have to ask ourselves very deep questions about what kind of society do we really want? What is our Singapore society? If on paper someone is supposed to get 600 to 800, and then it can even dwindle down to $200. I think we have a problem at a societal level for allowing this to go on. The second point on that is, what is the governance uh, and the measures put in by the government? We have heard already that we can substitute contracts. Surely this is a governance issue. When is the government going to stop this kind of practice and look deeper into substitution of contracts. There are, we need a whistleblower act. We need people to tell on each other that there is contract substitution and these workers are getting less and less depending on which is the company that is, uh, that is doing all this kind of stuff to the workers. So I, I feel that the first point is if we know so many stories about the migrant workers, we know, as Russell has said very clearly, the ventilation space is very small. They can't go to the speaker's corner and just stand there on the mound and talk about everything that has upset them. They need a permit, and I, I, I wonder whether a permit will be given. So where do, we, where do they go? They only have a space to go when the troubles are very deep. They go to the Ministry of Manpower or they go to the NGOs. But just to chat, just to walk, walk through their daily lives, I think that recreational space is Little India, in this case of the South Asian workers. If that is their recreational space, right, when you talk to them, I, 
last Sunday I was there and I was talking to some of them, this group of people who have been 10 years working here, eight years, and the last fellow well, four years, he were, they were saying that the space in Little India for them has become smaller and smaller over the years, which then means more and more workers have come to occupy that space. And we also would have noticed, we need to chart this history because I do not know, how much of space over the years has been fenced off. You put barriers and say this is not a space you can go through. We have empty plots of land also where there's a fence. So where do these guys have to hang out? Some space has been created, we, we must give credit where it is due, and some space has been taken away. And then we are told by anecdotal, uh, by anecdotes that they feel more and more workers have come in. So this is not uh, scientific, but these are serious considerations, I think, that the COI must look into. The second point of anger is the quick assumptions we have made. Oh, it must be drunkenness. Not only from residents, but even political leaders. The investigations are ongoing. We do not know exactly what are the investigation, uh, investigations and the outcomes, but already quite a number of statements have been made. The workers will tell you that they are upset. There, is, there are, of course, groups of workers who drink, get drunk, but there are also groups of workers who just come to hang out. Do we know the proportion, etc.? So I think the quick jumping to conclusions, I will put it forward very clearly, is not a process of bridging communities. It is divisive and especially against a group of people who work for us and honestly do not get great work working conditions. The second part of the discussion that I would like to raise is the obligations that the state has. I looked through all the ILO, docu uh, the ILO stuff that uh, we have ratified. Uh, ILO uh, 100 is all about equal remuneration. ILO 98 is about right to organizing and collective bargaining. ILO 105 makes it very clear that people should not be discriminated against, etc., and there shouldn't be any form of forced labor. ILO 29 tells us clearly that, the, that any work or service exacted in the virtue of, I mean, they have identified, sorry, what is considered to be forced labor issues. Then we have ILO uh, 47 and ILO, um, one more that I missed the number on, 143, that we have not ratified. These two are important documents under ILO. ILO is tripartite, government, union, and the employee. Very important combination which needs a lot of negotiation. Why are 47 and 143 very important? They both deal with migrant worker issues. Singapore has not ratified them. The conditionalities spelt out in 47 and 143 gives a lot of hope for better conditions, better approaches where the migrant worker is concerned. We already know we have a lot of migrant workers in our midst. So if we have so many, I go back to the original question, what kind of society do we want? What is a Singaporean and what do we value where this area of migrant workers is concerned? Therefore, what then should be a role for us? Shouldn't we then be lobbying our governments to get rat the ratifications going on 1, 4, 3 and 47? The next part of the obligations that I want to raise is this whole discussion on our laws. Russell has already put out some pertinent points about the law. And especially in this case of the riots, I want to bring our attention to the Immigration Act. Under Article 8.3D, who is a prohibited person? Any person who has been convicted in any country or state of an offence for which a sentence of imprisonment has been passed. 
next condition has not received a free pardon. Third one, and by reason of the circumstances connected with it, conviction is deemed by the controller to be an undesirable immigrant. These are some of the prohibition conditions under the Immigration Act 8.3D. Then we have um, from 33, 34, 35, that deal with primarily removal of persons unlawfully remaining in Singapore, detention of persons ordered to be removed, and power to arrest a person liable to removal. In all of these, there are powers for the state to just remove a person based on whatever the conditions attached to the removal. We have to ask ourselves whether this Immigration Act as it stands needs to be amended. Is this the way that we would like to treat anyone with a very clear route to deportation and not a clear route to justice. Which then brings me to my third big area. <coughs> at Marua, we have problems with the whole process at this point in terms of the deportation. What are the problems that we see? An investigation has taken place by the police. Out of uh, 4,000, it got dwindled to 400. And then 200 have been given an advisory of like, please behave yourselves, I suppose. Then we have had 28 people waiting for the trial to begin. Then we had seven who were acquitted and 53 who were to be deported. Somewhere along the way, the seven, four others were found to be actually, you belong to the deportation group. So from 53, it went up to 57. We have questions about this. The questions are of this nature. How, what is really the evidence that you, that has put all these folks in different tiers? Advisory, deportation, to be charged. What is it that has been found? This has to be a transparent and open process. It's a riot. It involved a lot of people. We want to know because it's also the uh, first time riot for all of us uh, in a very long space of years. So when we make these decisions at state level, the transparency is very important. The second point that's very important is the rule of law. Do we just decide that this person is to be deported or to be charged? Who makes that decision? Who is the mandate holder? We have always believed that when it goes to court, it will be assessed and there will be some discussion and you are in this box and you are in this box. But this has happened in quite a different way because of the provisions under the Immigration Act. The Ministry of Law keeps telling us that they can do this. Do we as a society agree that this is the way we want things done? We are not deporting one person. We are de deporting a group. Do we really know why? Are we going to just trust the state to say, yes, we believe that you know why, and therefore we agree with you. I think there's a lot of trust with the state. But there are also areas where we scratch our heads and wonder, now what happened there? From seven, why were four persons now moved into the other category? What happened to the evidence? Did you find more? Did you? So we have questions and we have a right to those questions. What are we, what am I saying between my point two and my point three? We have obligations, we have laws. Our laws are limited to a certain extent where it comes to access to justice. The third point that I'm re-emphasizing is, okay, if we want us to follow this process right now, then we need to have more information. We need to know how, who made these decisions if it did not follow a proper prosecutorial approach. The last point that I would like to make on this discussion for the moment is engagement. We have experts in, I was going to say in the house, but actually in the country, 
We have NGOs who work with migrant workers. We have uh, government offices in the Ministry of Manpower, in the Trade Union. We even have the, I, I stand corrected on this, I think it is the Asia Pacific Trade Union office out in Bukit Timah. We, many people in Singapore are working on migrant worker issues. What is the level of engagement to understand this? It is my hope that the COI doesn't just belong to this group of folks, but that they open up a lot of avenues to a lot of different groups, individuals, so that we understand this situation better. Meanwhile, we still have this situation of workers who have already been sent home. That issue, everything is there. And we also have the case of 28 that will be charged in court. So I think we ought to ask ourselves, I close with this question again. Is it time for us in our society in Singapore to stand up and ask ourselves, what kind of society do we want? And if our answer is a common value system, that whoever you are, I may not even like you, but you should be entitled to a pathway to justice. You should be entitled to an open and transparent system such that we all can rest at ease to know that justice has been done by you. So with that, I thank you. Next, we have Mr. Jolaga Graham, who is a social worker from Workfare Singapore. Workfare Singapore comprises a group of civil society volunteers who are working towards the improvement of labour conditions in Singapore. Jolaga has been involved in migrant rights activism for the past nine years with HOME, also known as the Humanitarian Organisation for Migration Economics, where he was its executive director. Jolaga will be speaking on the topic of post riot impact on workers and key issues. Thank you. Um, I would like to start off by playing a video first. Um, if you recall, last year, a similar big thing happened with migrant workers. There was a strike. Yeah, and um, what folks in workfare did at that time was we went to China to we went to China to interview some of the, the drivers who were who were charged and also those who had been deported. So um okay um so oh sorry the the duo somehow disappeared. Um, I'm unable to show it now but I will just talk a little bit more about um, the SMRT case. Um, if you recall, there was a worker called Bao Feng Shang yeah. last year um, in no, uh, in December. He was charged in court under the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Code, and he was accused of being of actively participating in the strike, and also for being rude to the SMRT management when they convened the meeting to talk about their concerns. So when we went to, to China to interview Bao Feng Shan, um, he was clearly still quite distressed and quite upset about what had happened. And he said that um, after the meeting with SMRT, um, police officers came um, to, to bring him to the police station to sign statements and to say that he would be charged in court for participating in the strike. And throughout that entire process, he said that um, when he was being charged, he didn't know what to do. He was very confused. Um, when he asked his Chinese embassy about getting a lawyer, they told him that if he wants to engage one, he would probably have to pay a lot of money and that the embassy would not be able to help. And so because of that, um, he said, well, I, I don't... I feel I don't have much of a choice, so I might as well just plead guilty 
yeah, and just add it to whatever um, charges that they are leveling against me. So um, I, I bring up Bao Fengshan's case um, specifically because um, it has broad implications um, in terms of issues of access to justice for, for migrant workers. Um, when, when Bao was charged in court, the senior district judge who presided over his case said that um, his involvement was calculated to cause disruption and inconvenience to transport services. But Bao Fengshan was not among the four who were eventually charged and convicted, also had planned and talked about the strike action. So according to him, when we interviewed him in China, yeah, he said that he was merely a participant. And he also refutes that he made those threatening comments to the SMRT management. Um, and even so, this also has little bearing in whether he participated in the strike or not. So, however, because he was unable to uh, afford a lawyer, he felt that there was little he could do to prove his case in court. And migrant workers are actually eligible for the Law Society's criminal legal aid scheme. Yeah, however, this scheme does not provide assistance to those who are charged um, under, say, the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act, and also a whole host of other offences like the Employment and Foreign Manpower Act. So, similarly, last year, um, 29 SMRT drivers were also deported, and their work passes were revoked without, in my view, um, respect for due process. So we also interviewed um, these workers in depth, those who were deported, and I will read some extracts um, based on the interview that we had in there. With them. This is what one of them had to say. They first revoked our work permits and got us to sign some documents. Then we were told we had violated some rules and laws and would be repatriated. The officer at the prison mentioned that they understood that we were feeling unhappy. But the whole thing has already been decided and there is nothing much we can do. Then the representative from the Chinese embassy showed up. We felt it was unnecessary for them to come because nothing was going to change. At 1 a.m. we went to the airport and at 6 a.m. we arrived in China. I stood up. Okay. Right. That was the mic, yeah? Just talk louder. Yeah, just speak loudly. <laughs> hello, hello. Okay. Um, okay, I continue what this uh, worker said. I stood up and asked what offence I had committed and why I was asked to leave. The officer said that it was due to the strike. I said it was not a strike. It was to defend our rights. The officer smiled. He told us this was not up to him. It was a decision from management. There was no room for reasoning. He was just going through the process. We then dealt with our bank accounts, immigration, and other government agencies, and finally my work pass was cancelled. Then we were taken to another room. After my work pass was cancelled, I felt like another person. I was no longer a respectable bus driver, but a prisoner. Maybe the way the police treated us as we moved from room to room made me feel that way. At the first room, I did my medical check, and in the next room, I was asked to take a shower. I told them I showered before coming. They were very forceful and forced me to shower. After that, our civilian clothes were taken and sealed in a big bag. We were given prison uniforms to change into. The shirt and pants were way too big for me. Then we were sent into a prison cell. They told us that whatever we were going to say would be futile. All documents were in English, and there was no translator. Some of us wanted to call our families, but they didn't allow us to and spoke to us in a rude manner. Later, we were sent to a prison cell, about three persons to a cell. We were told to strip off our clothes and change into prison clothes. Yeah, so this gives us some kind of insight into how the entire um, deportation um, process takes place. And with regard, um, to, to the riot, I believe that the 53 who were deported and even, among the, and even the seven who were actually acquitted um, amounting to, uh, who were actually, whose cases were discharged amounting to an acquittal, were also deported. And one of the, and some of the, and as I, as I was reading through 
the accounts of the 29 who were deported last year, I wonder if the 53 who were deported were also facing the same situation that the 29 did last year. And as Brema has mentioned, the Immigration Act has very arbitrary powers, and so does the Employment of Foreign Manpower Act. Um, because it allows the controller of work passes to revoke a work permit without the right of appeal. And, um, and the Immigration Act also allows for deportation, but um, in the law, anyone who wishes to contest this deportation is actually allowed to appeal to the minister. Yeah, but in the case which I've just described, and most certainly in the SMRT cases, um, the workers were probably not aware that they even could appeal to the minister to contest their deportation. So, and this is the issue of procedural fairness also. Was this informed to the workers? Because procedural fairness means that the administrator is obliged to give a fair opportunity to parties involved in the case um, to correct or contradict statements prejudicial to their view. And from how the state has responded to the SMRT cases and those who have been deported over the riot, we want, I wonder whether this was indeed the case. Were they told even that they could appeal to the minister against this deportation? Um, so, from a rights-based perspective, if we look at it in terms of access to justice, um, there are several issues um, that we need to ask ourselves in relation to due process and deportation. Um, costs and expediency versus access to justice. This was something which Workfare and Mauro had brought up. Um, the absence of an immigration tribunal to handle revocation of work passes and deportations. Um, whether government officials even inform immigrants that they have the right to appeal to the minister, like I mentioned, and the lack of transparency in reasons for deportation, because under the Act, the minister is not required to explain, because if he considers the explanation against the public interest to do so. Um, I would also like to talk about how the riot, the, the riot's implications in, in terms of how my fear is that it will enhance further social control mechanisms of migrant workers. Um, many of us involved in migrant rights activism have always advocated um, against many of what we think, um, many policies which we think restrict migrants' rights. And all this is done in the name of security. And um, some of the issues that we have been um, chipping against over and over again would be like the security bond. All migrant workers who are hired, uh, all employers who hire migrant workers have to guarantee the state a $5,000 security bond. This is in case the migrant worker gets into trouble or he or, he or she is not appreciated. Then the employer stands to lose this security bond if the worker is not controlled. And we've always believed that this security bond violates migrant workers' human rights in many ways. And in light of the riot, um, would measures, would this um, be further justification um, for the state to keep policies like the security bond? Another one would be the inability of workers to change employers. Because all low-wage migrant workers who come in are tied to the employer that applied for the permit. So you can't switch employers. And this is meant, and this is a social control mechanism. So would the riot lead to the state thinking that we should not give migrant workers so much mobility in employment yeah, because we need to control them further. And there's also the issue of repatriation companies. Yeah, repatriation companies are companies um, which specialize in sending workers back. Yeah, when employers want to deal with uh, workers that they, um, they feel have overstepped the boundary or they are unable to manage, they will hire repatriation companies. And these are guys who will manhandle the workers, um, lock them up in a room, for a few days, and then while the ticket is being purchased for them to be sent back. And during the entire period when they are locked up by the repatriation companies, they may be threatened in, uh, with things like blacklisting, they will not be able to come back to Singapore again, or they may even be assaulted. And the state so far has not come in to say that what the repatriation, that the repatriation companies' operations are illegal. Because it is. Um, Seizing somebody, seizing a worker and locking him in the room is wrongful confinement. And I can even, as far as I go and say it's abduction. Um, but in light of this riot, would 
the state then say, well, I think these repatriation companies actually serve a good social function in controlling these farm workers so that they don't run away and cause further problems for Singapore for the Singaporean public. Yeah. So, so this this is something which we need to I think uh, we we need to think about, and especially activists involved in this work. How are we going to proceed with our advocacy in light of this? And of course, after the riot, we had PM Lee saying that, oh, you know, we need to build more dorms, we need to uh, ensure that there are adequate recreational and social spaces for them. And what um, frustrates me about this is that we have been talking about adequate dorms for a very, very long time. Yeah, even before the Serangoon Gardens um, dormitory debate was adopted, and we were talking, the state had already acknowledged that there weren't enough dorms. And five years later, we are still talking about whether there are enough dorms. So we need to look at this in terms of, I think, the implications of our immigration policy. Is it sustainable? Because earlier this year, Corbyn once said, we need an additional 50 to 80,000 construction workers to build our BTO flats, etc., etc. And of course, the first thing that comes to mind is, where do you want to house them? Yeah, and I believe we do not have enough purpose built dormitories. Um, and decent accommodation for these workers. And um, I also like to talk about how this riot is going to lead to further policing of migrant workers, especially in the Little India area, where already boundaries have been have been erected. You know, um, not yeah, boundaries have been um, what do you call it? These metal um, barriers have been erected yeah, to prevent workers from going to housing estates. And I have personally seen how the Cisco police, for example, um, harass these workers when they, when they go too close to the barriers and they're told very rudely to go away, even if, when, they're just when they're just talking on the phone. Um, and some workers have also said that they have experienced um, harassment from some, um, the auxiliary police. So would this lead to further tensions even between the workers and the auxiliary police in the area? Um, finally, I think I would um, I'd like to talk a bit also about um, the Committee of Inquiry. Yeah. Um, moving forward, how should the Committee of Inquiry um, conduct its proceedings? This is something which um, um, folks in Workfare, we have talked and debated, and um, we have actually come up with some recommendations in terms of what the Committee of Inquiry to do, should do. So I'll, I'll just read them out here. Um, First, we, we feel that the committee should begin the deliberations after the pr criminal proceedings have been concluded so as to ensure that there is no conflict of process or of evidence and that the evidence and judgment from the criminal proceedings can form part of the evidence con considered by the committee. Um, secondly, hold all proceedings of the committee in public at a publicly accessible venue and open to members of the public and the local and international media. Appoint an independent assessor under Section 7 of the Inquiry Act who will ensure the independence of the inquiry and that these rules of the committee are adhered to. Um, fourthly, allow and enable written affidavits by members of the public to be submitted to the, to the committee in evidence. Um, allow and enable expert witnesses such as migrant labor activists, migrant worker non governmental organizations, and academics with specializations in public behavior, rioting migrant labor to give evidence either orally or in writing to the committee. Allow evidence based on academic research into crowd behavior, rioting and other related matters to be allowed into evidence. Allow and enable, and enable migrant workers who are present at the scene of the incident as well as other migrant workers who are acquainted with them and those who are experienced in the conditions of migrant labor in Singapore to give evidence orally or in writing to the committee. Allow such affidavits to be collated with the assistance of the migrant worker NGOs or others available to assist the affidavit writers. And lastly, ensure that all evidence presented to the committee be made available to the public on a publicly accessible platform. I think what we want to emphasize also is that there has to be a human rights approach towards how this thing inquiry is done. Um, so with that, how about the video? The video is about five minutes. So I'll show you the video.
We actually spent two hours interviewing him, but I'm just going to show you five minutes of the clip.
there's a lot more to the video. So, um, you know, I think you can find it on YouTube. How would, how would you find it on YouTube? Actually, it's not on YouTube. Oh, no, it's not. Yeah, so you're the first people to see it tonight. Okay. <laughs> when is it going to premiere? Uh, <laughs> not sure, not sure. Okay, so we look forward to that. But uh, I think there's a lot more richness that this film will bring to just the history to what happened with the you know, strikers last year. Uh, next, we have Mr. Vincent Long, who's from HealthServe. Uh, HealthServe is a non-profit community development organization dedicated to serving the interests of the migrants, disadvantaged, and poor in the local community, regardless of ethnicity, gender, language, and religion. Um, Vincent is the director of community health resources at HealthServe. He will be reading a statement on behalf of Executive Director Tang Shin Yong. Hi, um, so I have the easiest task here, just to read out a statement prepared for HealthServe. Uh, so, uh, let me begin. 8th December would have come and gone like any other Sunday for thousands of South Asian workers to converge in Little India on the day off. It would have been like any other Sundays for the last 10 years as workers make their way to the buses headed for the dormitories, an Indian worker died tragically in an accident, sparking off a riot never before seen in safe and secure Singapore. Unfortunately, it has taken such a tragedy to bring migrant workers' issues to the fore once again. These are long-standing issues that concern a group of people who are seen everywhere but I'm really there, the invisible workforce as it were. It is important that we value equally both the work done and each individual person doing the work and accord the same dignity we, as fellow human beings and citizens, would want others to treat us. The repatriation is also a stark reminder that we need a legislative process in our Immigration Act so that we can be a more gracious and compassionate society towards our migrant workers. As we work through these complex issues with the various stakeholders and members of civil society, we should not allow this incident to create further discrimination against migrant workers and further divide migrant workers and Singaporeans. Instead, we should be resolute about building an inclusive society based on mutual trust and respect. We have one million low-wage migrant workers to de develop our country's infrastructure. We need to appreciate the work that they do, give them their dues, implement a sustainable policy for migrant workers to live and work, and to assimilate them better into our society. The punitive measures used to bring the situation under control is but a carrot and stick approach. As much as we want the migrant workers to be clued in on our laws, cultures and customs, we must also be keen to learn their way of life and how they build community. This will help alleviate our fears, discriminations and presuppositions in the future. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now have a open Q and A. Uh, I'm sure there's uh, lots of questions and comments from the floor. Uh, again, uh, I just like to remind folks: uh, it would really have to be helpful if you introduce yourself a little bit, so that we can understand, uh, you know, where you're coming from and your question and your comment. Uh, and with that, uh, I guess I'll take show of hands, please, whoever wants to say. I guess the lady. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Um, hi, um, thanks for the talk. It's very interesting. My name is Serena. I'm studying law overseas. Just back on holidays. Um, well, I don't, I mean, I disagree with everything. All well, my friends actually say something quite interesting. And, you know, I, I completely agree that we ideally should have better working conditions for a lot of migrant workers here. And, you know, there's no excuse to say, well, look at Dubai. Is like I digress. So one thing that 
come here and get paid, even if we think it's a pittance, or to not have work at all. I, I mean, I know it's probably everyone here is getting ready to stone me or something, but personally, I just thought it was quite an interesting question. Yeah, um, actually, uh, I should have said, you know, uh, if we are asking a question, uh, if there's any specific speaker whom you want to direct that to, please specify. But I think uh, uh, Russell really wants to say something about that. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, this is not a big issue. It's raised by many forums. It's raised in the newspaper. Um, and I can't help think that the way it's framed seems to put you into the binary situation either or. I think the reality is rather more nuanced than that. Okay, Singapore needs foreign workers. Whoever we allow to work in this country, we should tell ourselves that they should be treated fairly and equally. And to me, that's starting point. Uh, it could not be that uh, because we think in that country they, they work under a situation far more harsh than here. Therefore, we are allowed to mistreat them 50% rather than 100%. I don't think, I don't think human relationships should be looked up. Uh, as to whether or not those people should be given a choice of their no work at all, basically we are dealing with a, a, very, a, a global economy that's increasingly becoming trans-border. And those questions can be asked here, can also be asked in, in those other countries like Bangladesh or India or China where they come from. Sure, if those countries, if they get the economy in place nicely, they would not need to export their workers. And I would leave those countries to sort out of those issues themselves. But for whatever country that feels that they need to send their workers overseas to work, and for whatever country that feels that we need these foreign workers, there should be a basic human decency kind of law which that come and work here, but I give you the full protection of my life, because I will protect my own city. because it's something which we hear a lot of and even the government ministries have this kind of attitude. If you read today's um, today paper, the, the letter which, which was written by the press sec to the law minister, she said that it was a privilege for foreigners to be here. It was a privilege for foreigners to be here. And 
let's face it, if all 1 million migrant workers in Singapore go on strike, this entire economy collapses. So it's not a question of them, them, being, them it being a privilege for them to be here. We also need them. So, I, so we need to be a bit more circumspect about this. And, and, I, and I also feel that when, we, when migrant workers are not exploited, when you provide adequate protections to them, it also helps local workers. And we need to realize that um, we should not have this false um, binary between migrant workers and local workers. Because one of the reasons local workers are displaced is because migrant workers are easy to exploit. It's easy to bully migrant workers. It's easier to, to make them work longer hours. It's easier to make them work for much lower pay. Yeah. So as a result of that, local workers' conditions don't improve. Yeah. So, so I think we need to, to, to look at this more, more holistically and, 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 and see that the, a lot of these problems are actually interconnected and that when we um, fight for migrant workers' rights, local workers will also I think the next person was actually... Anyone on that? No? Then Zijian and then Zijian. Just here. Oh, Zijian. Zijian. Yeah, okay. I'm Leong Siyan from Malua. Since there are more than a million uh, foreign workers, what you estimate is the total foreign levy that the government collects? <laughs> 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 what you estimate is the cost to the state if they do not deport all these people and put them through the full legal process. I'm just going to attempt it based on domestic workers. I don't know for the whole world. 2.6 billion. No stances. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that gives the answer to process. So let me just one point. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, whether or not we give these workers due process of the law, uh, it's not a question of dollars and cents. I think the state has never raised the issue of dollars and cents. It really is a question of political values. And that's it. I mean, at the heart of this discussion is what sort of political values prevail in this society? So it's a question we have to sort out politically, not really a question we can sort out legally in the court. Actually, Actually Russell, so, uh, uh, I think the truth is that a few days ago, the law minister and also minister for foreign affairs, Mr. K. Shamunga, has actually say, made references to expediency and the expense of uh, taking these cases through the courts. So it has been framed uh, in the, in the in, you know, in, in dollars and cents. But I think that's not actually very commonly uh, said that way. Uh, Francis. Francis. Okay, Francis. Uh, Francis Harvey. Uh, because we know that the COI is going to be uh, convened very soon. And what happened tonight, the, the, the things that you have discussed tonight, now, how comfortable or how sure are we that some of these views, especially what Jolivam said, you know, a whole list of stuff, has these views actually been presented to COI? Because there's already a sense that PM Lee actually said this is a law and order issue, full stop. So are we, are we comfortable or are we certain that some of these views are going to be presented to them and let them look at some of these ideas as well. So has something been done to ensure that this will happen? Of course, they can reject it and say, oh, this is a law and order issue, and full stop, and you know, let's carry on there. But these views are so critically important for them to also see that it's taken into consideration. So, I mean, all your NGOs, what has been done to do that, to ensure that some of this will happen? I, I just share a, a bit, and then you can I, some of the discussions have even come from the think tanks already, you know, that they too want to put up papers or whatever. So I think there are going to be many pockets. For us in Marwa, I think many in Marwa do not know this, but I said we too have to put up a paper. And I think maybe more important than the paper approach is whether we should have conversations like this. and get the public more involved in this process. If people are willing to turn up and work our way through, because there's so much information that many of us do not know. Yeah, I think.
some of us think we know, but actually the, the, the information lies with the NGOs, what is the real story on the ground, then I think we can really ask for what we, uh, what we really want as a result of the COI. And that's what I can share. I think we should at least conversation. Yes, I, I agree, that, and which is why um, Workfare, we, we, we came up with those recommendations. And in fact, the Prime Minister has said that anyone who wants to actually um, be somehow involved in the process, I'm not sure what the exact wording is like, when he said that, that we could actually, um, people can actually be involved in the process. So um, Workfare, we do intend to actually officially write to us to be part of that process. So we'll, we'll see whether, um, how that pans out. One example I can give is, is wages. Um, in, in the years that I've been involved in this, I have seen workers who are paid like $2 an hour. Yeah, and Bangladeshi workers in shipyards are happy to work for $2 an hour, $3 an hour. So how, how is the Singaporean worker ever able to compete on these kinds of wages? The worst case I have seen is this guy who was paid $1.82. Yeah. And, 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 the, and, and because we don't have a minimum wage law, right? So these kinds of contracts are allowed to, to be signed. Yeah. So, so if we continue to allow um, employers to pay workers at such appallingly low levels, we, the Singaporean worker will never be able to, um, um, I mean, their, their wages will never increase. Yeah, because there's a huge army of workers from Bangladesh, India, and China who are willing to take it at a much lower level take a job at a much um, lower salary. And, and working hours also. Um, migrant workers, are, uh, it's, it's a norm for them to work 12 hours a day. Yeah. And, and, they don't, and, and they will accept working 12 hours a day, seven days a week. But Singaporeans will never be able to accept these kinds of conditions. What about our work-life balance? Yeah. So, but for the company, their only concern is cost right, and profit. So I don't care about your work-life balance. I mean, I can I have this cheaper foreign worker who's a, who, who's willing to work seven days a week, twelve hours a day, and you can't do it. So of course I prefer to hire him. Yeah. So so that's what I mean uh, in terms of the, the connections. Yeah. So we, we migrant workers need better protection. Yeah. In terms of uh, so that they're not badly exploited. Otherwise, local workers will always always be exploited. If I can just add to that, it's more applicable for. Prior to 2011, uh, as passes, uh, people with double masters, masters degrees to come to Singapore, work for 1008, and there was a substitution in fact, meaning new graduates were coming out, they were asking for 2000 plus, so it was cheaper to hire foreign graduates actually. So that answers your question, basically. All right, um, anyone else with questions? Yeah, I yeah. uh, James Gomez. Um, I wanted to know if any of the panels singularly or collectively can map for us who are the employers. Are they MNCs? Are they local SMCs? Are they JLCs? Just to give us an indication of where the workers are because I think these companies also hold this responsibility and I think in this conversation that is missing and I think a certain mapping of who the employers are and where the exploitation worst takes place can help us have a better and fuller picture as well. Sorry James, I wish I had those that profile for you but it's not something that GWC2 has been focused on to map this. Basically we know the sectors that foreign workers are let into the construction marine. And we want to, we can look at a list of companies that are uh, <coughs> involved in the sector. We can maybe guess the size sizes if it's, uh, it's one of our state-linked companies like Capital you know, is pretty big. But I'm not able to tell you what proportion will be employed by which company. 
However, that as a as a general sense, though, I think the bigger companies with a reputation to uphold tend to have less of a governance problem. They tend to treat workers uh, better, or according what to what the rule should be. Uh, sometimes you get situation where the big company subcontracting <coughs> out, and that can be a problem because the subcontractor is the one that is the that is the the, the misbehaving party. Uh, but it's it's murky out there. Uh, so I'm just offering some broad uh, observations that I have over the years, but I don't have this, the data that you want to Okay, the thing is, the, okay, I'm from the construction industry. So the thing is, right, the, Singapore has a very big, uh, big issue of uh, subcontracting. Because we were, not talk, we were talking about NMC subcontracting to the first tier companies, but this first tier company will subcontract to second tier. Then this sub second tier is up to third tier. So that's why it means you have like people paying that low. It means uh, you have foreign workers willing to pay that. Uh, means to work at this very low price. You have the third tier company that are willing to actually quote at this price. Then you have the second tier company and third tier company. This, this thing actually holds holding it for So the, the problem might be even more than its uh, purpose as what we can, we can see. We, we, it's very hard to tie in means which are the companies that are engaged in this. Uh, even like it means like. Uh, company with uh, respectable backgrounds, right? they might just outsource to some companies that doesn't really uh, have any support, uh, adherence to the labor laws, etc. Yeah. yeah, actually thanks for bringing that up, Terry, because I wanted to talk about subcontracting, because many of these big companies, even though they are not culpable, but a lot of their, their projects are subcontracted out to contractors, and they often don't exercise any oversight in terms of how their subcontract is managed. So you have companies that will they will win all these CSR awards, um, Corporate Social Responsibility Awards, but then they are totally guilty of subcontracting the work out to, to companies that are very exploitative. And, and it's a, in the whole chain, I mean, everyone is complicit in it. Um, I mean, I have seen, like, for example, shipyard workers, yeah, on Keppel, Sembawang, Jurong Shipyard, like, Keppel has this big CSR profile. Um, but there they are workers who are on their yards, subcontracted by other companies, who are also exploited. <coughs> And who are being paid two dollars, three dollars an hour, yeah. And even government agencies like HDB, SMRT. I have workers coming, working on these sites, coming um, to me for help, saying that their employers withhold their wages, deduct their wages. So it's quite. I mean, in, in terms of um, the accountability, I think if you were, if you really want to trace, you'll be able to see the connections. But whether they are directly culpable or not, that's another issue altogether. But I tend to be more. Uh, I, I mean, I tend to have high expectations of bigger companies because they have the resources to exercise that kind of oversight. So um, I, I feel that as part of their corporate social responsibility agenda, they need to include this, yeah, rather than just um, set up a foundation, for example, to give to a charity. Yeah, but also ensure that you know, human rights of the workers that they employ and engage are, are, are upheld. Yeah. Sorry, I'll, I will just add something to that. Um, actually, the Singapore Labour just to maybe add on to the contract worker discussion, I think there are measures by the UCC, w, I'm trying to remember the right name, Unit for Casual and Contract Workers within the NTUC because it has affected the Singapore workers. This whole business of outsourcing has affected the Singapore workers who are also on this subcontract over and over again. I think if that is already happening to Singapore workers and measures have been put in, I think it is happening also to the migrant workers at a more drastic level. I just wanted to add that on. The second point is on CSR. Companies, because I get involved on the Singapore Compact discussions, companies still see CSR as the philanthropy arm. They are not seeing it enough and strongly enough as an internal value system on the rights of your workers and how you are really dealing with your own workers from social security to, to decent wages, work conditions, etc. So both we have, we have issues and I just wanted to say that. Thanks. I just want to add a little bit to the discussion on subcontracting because uh, I work in the technology world and there's a direct analogy to what has happened to companies like Apple because in the consumer electronic space, there is much more subcontracting than you ever get in construction. Right? Everything is sliced and diced and it's a global uh, supply chain. And so what the big companies do is very simply, 
include a clause in the contract saying that if you bid for my job, you have to ensure that you and all your downstream suppliers comply with these labor standards and so on and so forth. There is a simple, well, I wouldn't say it's a simple fix, but conceptually, it is not difficult. It is a question of willingness. We've seen that happen in the technology world. Apple has done it, which is why you know, big companies like Honhai uh, and, and face all these problems uh, with their big China, China plants. And some of you will have seen the news uh, stories on that. But I just wanted to share that kind of different perspective as well, which is that this is not a problem that cannot be fixed. It's a question of willingness. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So my name is Gaurav. I'm a journalist, and we publish a fortnightly newspaper in Singapore, and I sometimes work with the independent as well. Uh, to add to what Gomez was saying, and Ramana, actually, you, met, you were the only one who mentioned this. Uh, I'm going to play it as a here. The entire discourse is about the laws and government and you know everything what the government is doing. But what about, as you said very rightly, I think, in my opinion, what about the Singaporean society? You don't have, as he said, you don't have a mapping of who the employers are. But since 2000, Kumaran said, since 2011, HDB is the biggest construction company in Singapore, right? The biggest, you are talking about capital, capital and whatever. The most construction that is being done in Singapore is by the government. And that government is charging, and property prices is a big issue. The government is facing another election, and that's why all these measures have been put in place to bring down property prices. Are Singaporean as a society ready to pay more prices for their properties? Because the, the <laughs> HDB is making a house, and that, uh, that house is being priced by a construction company. That construction company will not absorb, you are saying minimum wage rules. That construction company will not absorb if you raise the wage from 200 to 800, right? That will be passed on to Singapore, right? So is Singapore and the society ready to have increase in property prices? First question. Second, uh, because evidence is contrary to this, because you said there are three SPS journalists here. They keep doing stories on domestic workers. MOM, or I don't know which agency, they actually initiated a day off. All the maid agencies in Singapore say 70 to 80 percent of employees of maids are not giving that day off, right? So even if you have laws, but the society is not willing. I mean, you talk about. I come from India. I worked a lot for labor issues in India. If you if you insist that people should be paid, is society as a whole willing to give up that much? Give more money to HDB for because. No matter what the finance minister said, we know that Singapore is not a wealth society, right? So what, whatever the increase in property price, prices, that will be absorbed by the consumers, not by the HDP. Government will not subsidize it. So what I want to know is, as Brahma was saying, what kind of society, what do you want, right? Because uh, I just finished by one more thing. Because as you are saying, I did when I I didn't meet you, but I keep meeting Devi. And you said that Singaporeans, the construction workers, have no problem with Singapore. So there is absolutely no evidence of it. Because Amma actually said they work throughout the day. They go and sit in a dormitory. They on Sundays a bus takes them to Little India. They go back to their dormitory. They don't come in contact with Singaporeans. So where is the avenue for them to interact with Singaporeans? So as you are saying that they all, because I, in one of my stories I have said this, that you have comments from workers who say that we like Singaporeans, but we don't like our boss. Because construction workers don't interact with Singapore. As Brahma was saying, the recreational space is getting less and less. So this is no evidence to, you know, that they don't, they don't interact with Singaporeans, that they don't know how Singaporeans treat <laughs> So, uh, hold on, let me, let me just, because I want to add about the cost of workers. Yeah. Because the cost of workers, if you think about the total cost of a house, the smallest part, my guess, is actually the cost going to the, the price for the wages. Because the land cost is huge. Mm -hmm. The developer, you know, he's driving his Mercedes and his bungalow and all that. That's a lot. The cost and material cost is also much higher. The worker cost actually is a very small proportion of the total cost if you talk about construction. So even if you increase their wages by a lot, it will not affect the price of that whole uh, uh, price of the house or something. I'm going to exercise the moderator's prerogative. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there is a persistent, I, I don't want to say myth, but it's a persistent belief that it basically costs, I don't know, $50,000 to build a flat. Yeah. And the rest is all land cost. And you know, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna say point to that guy who's moving <laughs> Leong Zi here because if you want to find out more about that, <laughs> the cost of building an HDB flat. How much of this is land cost? How much of this? One minute. One minute. Uh, actually, the, the <coughs> price of the HDB flat has very little to do with the cost of construction. Exactly. Or how much you pay the worker. Depends on how much the government wants to charge for the land, which they have not told us for the last 29 days. <laughs> but uh, from all the crunching we can do, it's probably about 60% of the cost of the flat. And see, like the mic can have another 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. I think the statistics give very good clues to so many of the questions and issues that you have raised. There are about more than 500,000 residents who earn less than $1,500. If you include the self employed people, we think it's close to 600 or 600,000. We estimate about 400,000 earn less than 1,002. And even people who work full time, 114,000 earn less than $1,000. And all this has to do with foreign workers. Huh? Someone asked, huh? you know, are they taking jobs? Look at the unemployment rate. Which job category has the second highest unemployment rate? Cleaners, laborers, and general workers. You know what's unemployment rate? That means the Singaporeans who were working as cleaners and laborers and general workers, when they lose the job, probably to a foreign worker, can't even get employed back to the same job. The highest one is sales and service workers. You know Singaporeans don't want to be sales and service workers? And that's the highest unemployment rate. Yeah, but go already. That's very much for me. <laughs> okay, uh, I think you asked two questions. The first question was on property prices. Second question was on Singaporeans not being willing to give a day off uh, for foreign domestic. No, that, that was not a question. I was just saying because you have no anecdotal evidence about how many, as you said, you don't know how many SMEs or MNCs are employed. Because the point is, as he, if I understood him correctly, he was saying, Major, majorly companies are employed by Singaporeans, yes. I mean, and they are not willing sure. to pay, right? Sure. So that's, that's it. Thank you for that comment. Uh, I think Terry wanted to say uh, Sorry, the point, the point about them is like foreign workers that you don't get in touch with uh, Singaporeans. I think that's really grossly wrong. And like, example, construction workers, they actually deal with Singaporeans, so that means uh, Singaporean workers, co-workers. Singaporeans, that means the like residents. Uh, uh, say, let's say you're saying service cleaners, right? Conserv the conservatory cleaners in the uh, yeah, house. Uh, uh, that was not okay. my point. That okay. was okay. Brahma's okay. point. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Both of them were contradicting each other. I That's would like, like to, to move on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or comments from anyone else on the board? I'll give priority. No, no, to but sir, my question still remains. Are Singaporeans ready to pay for yeah, exactly. yeah. Yes. Okay. No, but that's a <laughs> false question. But, but, Let's assume, let's assume, let's assume that doing the right thing for foreign workers will increase housing prices. Who here in this room is willing to pay more for the HDB? Yeah, that was the question. Let's take, a, let's do a straw poll. Who will be willing for that? And I will, I will say that this is a skewed sample. <laughs> this is a skewed sample. <laughs> No, no. It's a fantasy question. I just say that our state's uh, stance on populism is that it's a no-no. So okay, chances guys. are if we are a minority, we're on the right side. This time. Okay, guys. <laughs> let's, let's all take out that. Hang on. All right. Who wants to make... So we've, yeah. we've kind of addressed that yeah. question. All right. Uh, any... Who's next? Uh, I think you first, and then Ben after that. So you first. Uh, your question is flawed because the prices are quite significant. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, just uh, building on some of the previous questions. My name is Krishna. Uh, it's a question for the whole panel. Uh, what are some of the big gaps or unknowns in the work that you do in terms of data and information? And what kind of research or data or information would make your job easier? And how can civil society contribute to getting this? So I'm sure everyone sitting here has a lot to say. And so, do you, do you want to speak to that? No. Alright, so we'll, why don't we start with Prima, then Russell, then Jojo, because they all have something to say. <laughs> Actually, I have two things to say. I'm going back to the cost question now that I've got the mic. I just want to say this small point. Eh? I think you have raised a very valid question about what kind of society do we want. 
And if we talk about wages, etc., and it really pushes up the cost, then we have to decide whether we are willing to accept it. But this kind of thing is a mantra that the government has used. Every time we touch something, are you willing to pay more? Are you willing to pay more? These guys who are, we, whom we believe should go through a proper process, uh, it will cost us. That is uh, the wrong discussion by our political leaders. What we need to talk about is doing the right thing by the citizen and by the foreigner. So for me, it's very clear. And, and I think Zuyan has spoken a, a lot about the prices of flats and the land costs. I just want to say, no, I'll just add, I want to go to just, the other I'll just, I'll just add one more. Please, Carl. We can continue the discussion yeah. after the okay, I, I just get. want to go to that. I think for us, uh, from Marua, human rights, the right to information <coughs> is a big issue for us, uh, as, as an issue that you put out there. And I think for all of us who have done work in journalism, who have done work in NGO, who have done work, we know that it is very difficult to get accurate data. And then we have also data that comes in a bigger group these days, you know, Singapore residents. The residents will be citizens and PRs. So how do we see patterns? That kind of pattern is becoming a privilege and who really sees that? is going to become a tough question. So when, when James asks us the question, who are the uh, employers, etc., we are always struggling with data. And I think if you look at the back of any <coughs> annual report, I studied the HDB for some time now, I haven't gone back. You will see more and more information being summarized. So when the group gets bigger, a whole thing can fall in, and hopefully it's not as big as an elephant. Right. Um, the MON uh, webpage is a chock block of statistics, and sometimes it's useful, you can find a figure there, and sometimes it's not, depending on what you want. For instance, uh, <coughs> let's say a pertinent question I would ask would be, for instance, foreign domestic workers, uh, how many of them go renew their contract after one term? Very, very good indication of whether uh, how happy they are or how good their employers are to let them stay on. Um, I remember two, three years ago, there was a figure that was thrown up by the MOM in a much longer press statement that they had. And I, that figure was actually quite low. I can't remember that. But you see, you, you see, these figures are not regularly updated. <coughs> every year you have that stats available and you can chart a kind of trend. It really emerges only when someone asks a question, maybe it's in Parliament, and then it comes up as a part of a statement that addresses so many issues. So for those of us in civil society, we try to track it, but there are so many issues to track that we definitely uh, have gaps. So it's an ongoing thing <coughs> to, to build up a profile of all the so many issues affecting uh, foreign workers. Yeah, it, uh, information is very, is certainly very difficult to come by, and um, I mean we don't even have basic stats like how many Chinese workers are in Singapore, how many Bangladeshi workers are in Singapore, and I find myself having to comb through a lot of reports, newspaper articles just to put figures together to make sense of something, and um, and, and this is important because the government likes to say that our measures are effective, we have prosecuted people and all that, but the question is how many have you prosecuted? out of how many complaints, for example. And oftentimes the data is not disaggregated. Yeah, so it's very difficult to determine. Uh, for example, just recently in relation to the riot, um, Tan Chuan Jin said that uh, we only received 3,000 complaints yeah, out of like the 1 million migrant workers here. Yeah, but he was probably only referring to salary-related complaints. Yeah, what about complaints um, relating to other, other types of legislation like work injuries, employment agents, and problem of foreign manpower. So, so it's a very selective use of statistics also. Yeah. So it's, it's very difficult to, to, to get a, a good sense of what's happening because um, these data just comes out in drips and drabs, and it's not contextualized, not disaggregated. I want to share some of my experience on getting data when I was in Parliament. Uh, I was in Parliament from 2007 to 2009 as a nominated member of Parliament. And during that time, I kind of felt that you know, you get, as an MP, you kind of get a quota 
for parliamentary questions every time Parliament sits. And so I just went out of my way to find out more. Right? I, I also did reach out to some uh, academics and think tanks and just asked, hey, you know, if there's anything you guys want to know, tell me. I'll try to I'll try, uh, file questions and just find out for you. This is what I learned. I learned that information asymmetry is very real and alive in Singapore and it's very deliberately kept alive. I can only speculate as to why, but I'll tell you that the outcome is that the government has a very strong strategic advantage in any policy debate because they know all the statistics. You never know what you don't know. You never know what you don't know. And so, in a policy debate, you never know what the government will come up next in terms of statistics. And I actually don't... I take it as an article of faith that when the government says X percent or Y percent, that percent is real. They did not make that up. But you have to question the assumptions, how they got there, what are the things they are not telling you. Right? And in my experience, when I filed questions in Parliament, this was in Parliament, mind you. You can file a question, you never know what you're going to get. Right? There is no obligation for a minister to, there's no convention even, for a minister to fully answer your question. They will always answer the question that they want to answer. Right. So I can ask for X, Y, Z in excruciating detail, I get aggregated summary. And that goes to the, that answers later. That until and unless we have a Freedom of Information Act in Singapore, the, our ability to access data and the amount of data that we have will always be held hostage to the government's interest and what they want to disclose. Uh, Alex has asked to ask, uh, make a comment. So. Sorry, um, Alex, uh, at this moment I'm speaking for the WC2. I know I'm like a hydrated monster. Regarding <laughs> 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 um, the question about data, what are the gaps? Uh, I mean, I think uh, you know, they've given us quite a lot of answers, I particularly second Jonathan's point and Tom Holmes. Um, but I would say that with respect to migrant workers, um, while we may look to the government for the statistical data, for example, like how many of each nationality are here, basic information you might think, but not available. Uh, in many ways, um, it is possible for civil society to go out and get their own data. But because of the nature of the migrant community as one that is not particularly plugged into the digital space, and one that is relatively invisible, it will take an incredible amount of footwork. For example, just to find out, just to give you an idea, just to find out what percentage of foreign domestic workers still do not get a weekly day off despite what the law says, you can find out. You can get a good statistician will say, let's do a random sample of so many HDB blocks, let's knock on every door within that block, and then if you have a large enough sample, you can come up with a pretty good estimate for the nation, right? But it needs good work, all right? Unfortunately, we're gradually becoming a generation that is only comfortable sitting in front of a computer. Uh, we hope that data spews up on the screen, and I think very few of us want to sweat it out climbing the stairs, and walking, pounding the streets, and speaking to strangers, getting data. So in many ways, we at PWC2 have plenty of ideas to do research. We just don't have the manpower. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any other, anybody else? OK, I'll give, I'll let Honey then. Honey? Um, basically, you Uh, like I think a few of us, like Grandma, myself, Vincent, Jonathan, we, we were at um, 
Little India in the first week of, uh, you know, after the riot. And, you know, the people selling alcohol, their business is very badly affected. Like, you know, I managed to speak to one, and, you know, he actually said that one weekend, you know, uh, it's actually the sale um, dropped between like five to eight thousand, some even more. So I'm saying, like, what happened to the Singaporeans selling shops, you know, and, and I think their voice is also not being uh, heard. And I think, you know, the government uh, putting, uh, you know, uh, a, a ban like that is also quite problematic. Yeah, so anyone can take it next. <coughs> I think that was more of a comment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to ask about um, repatriations. Because it's obviously not something that's just happening in response to a strike or in response to a riot. In the papers today, it says that for the last few years, there's been an average of 13,000 repatriations annually. Um, in light of the recent conversations about the gaps in data, this may be a slightly futile question to ask, but um, uh, perhaps the panel can tell us more from what they know about the, the patterns of these repatriations, the processes that are followed on a much grander scale than just the 50 people um, from the riot, and what the effects of that are, and how perhaps it can be better dealt with. I can only, uh, <coughs> you speak, the figure is just called 13,000, I haven't read the papers yet, but uh, evidently, this 13,000 <coughs> pro probably wouldn't be just uh, foreign workers uh, accused or suspected of riot, you know, they say, hey, uh, one can speculate it could be people like in here who are mm -hmm. uh, the government suspect of uh, Say someone who is not describing a sex worker, for instance, and say therefore that's the child we never repatriate him. That kind of thing can be any number of reasons. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know the, the configuration yeah. Yeah, for this 13,000, and I agree with <coughs> also, but I think the process is a problem. Uh, I mean, when I was with TWC2 and all that, we know of <coughs> workers who are just sent off like that, and we and the education is that every worker, even after you have crossed into the immigration site before your pa you put your passport through, you can always go to the corner, the immigration site, and say I've got outstanding matters, and they will have to accede to whatever your outstanding matter is for further investigation. I think that knowledge is still not out there. And repatriation can be a whimsical, can be real. We all do not know unless Jonathan knows more about this. Um, do you, Jonathan? I, I suspect most of them are those who have overstayed and uh, documented. Um, that, 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 that figure that's good. I, I saw that article actually, and I think but again, it wasn't this aggregated, so, so it's very hard to, to tell. But, but my sense is that most of them are probably overstays. But there are also other categories like um, those who are deported because they have HIV or they have some kind of a disease and they didn't pass the medical tests. Yeah, so, so they get deported as well. And also those on social visit passes who are, who are caught doing um, sex work or Running some illegal hawker business, selling curry puff by the streets, you know that kind of thing. So um, it's, it's it's quite a, a, a wide range, yeah, I, I would say. But my guess is that most of them are most of those are the ones who have stayed. I'm gonna say ladies first, but not yet. Hi. Um my comment or question is in relation to the response today to both. Uh, Jolvin's and Prima's letters to the Straits Times Forum. So the <coughs> today, oh sorry, today. So the response from the Secretary to the Minister of Law. Um, there was this one particular line that really threw me off. That said, "What is the benefit to Singaporeans in um, giving the workers uh, who are being repatriated due process?" And to me, the question completely threw me off because it seems completely irrelevant to me what the benefit is to Singaporeans to defend or to uphold the human rights of a migrant. And, and so I, my, my question, that's my comment. My question then is that, do you think it is problematic that we continue to engage with them on, on this platform that um, when all of their discussion about any human rights issue is on, oh, well, are Singaporeans ready for this? Or what is the impact on Singaporeans? Are Singaporeans ready to pay for this? And 
and you know, while we make comments about um, how it's, it's, be it's um, beneficial to local workers too if we improve migrant workers' rights, is that the platform on which we should be defending migrant workers' rights, that it's because it's beneficial to us? That might be a, a, a maybe a, something that comes out of it. Um, and and it, it's helpful to point to that because it points out the complexity of the linkages between their rights and ours. But do you think it's problematic that we keep continuing to engage on these issues on, on, on a, on a cost issue. benefit to Singaporeans issue? And is cost and benefit only in terms of economic mm -hmm. and financial issues? I, I was thinking as I was reflecting on that question that was asked, mm -hmm. as a Singaporean, the benefit to me that a migrant worker is given due process is that I can sleep well at night knowing that there is that I that there's a just and fair system. So um, I find that there is it is it is really um, a, sim a, a very pitiful situation that that um, that everything is, is monetized and Singaporeans then have to bear the burden of justice on the basis that that you know, oh I'm not ready, it's it's my fault because I I have all these other stresses I have to deal with that I can't think about my green workers' rights. I will just answer from my what side and the BP2 is here, so he too can add in because we were struggling with this whole thing for the, almost the whole day. We have just put up our response on the website and I think it is there. But I think that last question is a general view, but I think it is a very typical way in which the discourse takes place. It is very typical, you know, at the end of the day, you are the citizen. I must take care of you, the citizen. And I think this is the paradigm that we are all buying into. And this is why at the beginning I asked that question, what kind of society do we want? What kind of values do we want to embrace as Singaporeans? The, the, if I'm a polit politician, that is how I will speak, right? Because the Foreigner is not really going to give me the vote, it is the Singaporean. I am just being uh, pushing it to the limits, but I think a, pol a, a politician has a moral duty to the population to enhance our value system, to deepen our whole moral uh, attitude and ethics by being consistent in, to, to the human condition. But in our case, it is always very divisive and cost comes in very quickly because we have dangled the, the, the cost stick or carrot. Sometimes it's a carrot depending how they are talking and sometimes it's a stick. So we have bought into it. I'm sorry, I feel differently about this. I feel, maybe many will not agree with me. I feel that the Singaporean has bought into this whole thing about cost and, and, and we either do not know how to get out or we do not want to see. I mean, I have asked, just to go on another uh, diversion here, I've asked people, why do they keep upgrading their flat? Because when you keep upgrading, who's going to bear the cost? You have escaped, maybe, but someone down the road is going to pay the price, which is what exactly is happening now. But let's not forget, our political leaders all encouraged us to keep upgrading. That was the value system they gave us and many bought into it. So uh, downstream, the, the younger folks are now being affected. So I'm just saying that uh, that is the typical uh, approach and we have to keep rejecting it. That's all I can say. I, I don't think many, I, I don't know how many agree here, but I don't think many of us will agree to that kind of approach. Yeah? I agree with you. You agree that the government's. Uh, I, I mean, that's something that I've talked about with my friends extensively, and I think it has been very, I'm very blessed to be studying this case to be able to take a more detached um, perspective, really. And, and it's very troubling because a lot of these so called people that I studied with, the JPS, and the they just completely bought into this story. And you're talking about some of the best, most intelligent minds that we're supposed to have. Okay, we are coming up to nine o'clock. Uh, we're coming up to nine o'clock. I think our booking is until uh, only until nine. So Vincent gets the last I'll make question. My, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. my point very quickly. But I, what I was going to refrain from speaking because we've got the experts there, and I've got experts and Singaporeans to speak. Uh, and I'm not an expert by any means, apart from talking. 
<laughs> but I think it's an important point to make in relation to the lady's question about deportation. Uh, uh, firstly, in relation to the two ministers and their brother Spurlius arguments uh, in relation to deportation, but also in relation to the illegal repatriation. So there's two types of removals from Singapore. And I would have thought the 13,000 is the re uh, removals under the Immigration Act. And that's quite broad. There are nine categories of prohibited immigrants that you can remove from the country. And they, can, they are very broad, some of them. Uh, the second point in the uh, Immigration Act is that the minister can act on information and remove anybody, any foreigner he deems fit, without having to publish that information. The person being removed can ask for the information, the minister will have to provide it. And in 1993, I don't know, come on as a lawyer, may know this, but in 1993, they quietly amended the Immigration Act and several other pieces of legislation to remove the right of uh, judicial review. That means you can, a court cannot inquire into the minister's action. Quietly slipped into quite a few acts in 1993. So that's the first point to make, it's, as some people have already made on the panel. It's massively broad, the powers that are provided which is what is worrying because of the 57 that were deported today and the 29 last year. Uh, the second point is in relation to the illegal repatriation that uh, the companies do, or their government has described it, so I don't have to do it. But just to remind people here that, as Donovan said, the, the, those, de those repatriations are illegal under two provisions of the Penal Code, abduction and kidnapping. Abduction and Wrongful confinement. Wrongful confinement. Wrongful confinement. Wrongful confinement. Wrongful confinement. And speaking as someone who used to be in BW2, we actually sat in a meeting with the senior director of uh, 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 MOM, who said, and I'm sure the other people can, can remember it, who were there, she said, she said, they, so that's a clue, what you can go and find out. She, <laughs> they provide a useful service. So this is a, 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 a government servant uh, legitimizing the breaking of the law. So which is why I thought I had to make that point because it's a very serious point and you know we have uh, 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 people in government kind of closing a blind eye to the blatant uh, 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 convention of law. Thank you. Uh, we are slightly past nine, so uh, I'm going to call this to a close. But um, I just want to take something that Vincent said uh, about you know judicial review and you know whether ministers order can be challenged, and this troubles me. This concerns me a lot as a as a lawyer. One of the things that you study about as when you're a lawyer, one of the things you study is concepts of rule of law. You know, what does it mean to be in a society that's governed by rule of law? And that's why this question of repatriation and deportations <coughs> of the migrant workers really troubled me a lot. I, I think I was overseas when I read all that news. And it really troubled me a lot because it felt like ministers and civil servants were making decisions that affected people's lives in a very, very severe and significant way without there being any check, any avenue for recourse, any openness and transparency. When you go through the court system, everything is open and available. Charges are published documents. Judgments are published. Everyone can see. You cannot hide. When things are handled in an administrative fashion, administrative decisions, they are not open to review. Nothing is published, nothing is disclosed. They don't <coughs> tell you what they want, you, they want you to see. And that troubles me. In the rest of the common law world, Singapore is a common law country, in the rest of the common law world, the courts have gone down the path of saying that the courts always, always have the ability to question and review administrative decisions made by the government. That is what rule of law means. In Singapore, we've gone on a different path. <laughs> In Singapore, we've gone on a different path. Some of you, and I know I'm going on a tangent, but you know, this is for me. This really sums up what we've been talking about today about repatriations, about how we're dealing with these migrant workers. In Singapore, after Operation Spe uh, Spectrum, one of the detainees, Cheng Xuanzi, appealed all the way to the Court of Appeal. This was a landmark case called Cheng Xuanzi where the Court of Appeal for the first time said, yes, in Singapore, we looked around the world, and in Singapore, the court agrees that the courts have the power to review ISA detentions. What, does, what happens in Singapore? The government changes the law. 
the government changed the, changed the law to say, in a very clumsy fashion, if you're a lawyer, I have to say. But the government changed the law to say that no, the courts cannot, do not have this power. And since then, the courts have retreated. We've gone, we've gone back to that path where the courts will say, no, we cannot review the merits. We cannot look into why the government uh, makes decisions that it does. We can look at certain things which are, for the most part, procedural. Some have called it thin rule of law. Others have called it rule by law. Right. I'm sure people here are familiar with that. that. All that offends me as a lawyer. It offends my innate sense of justice, of fairness. I think it offends everyone, everyone here. It offends your sense of justice. Why are you here? Right. And that, for me, that's the crux of this case with the migrant workers, with how we're dealing with them, with how we're repatriating some of them without putting them through the process. And that is why the Ministry of, of Law statements upset me a little bit. Right. So, coming back, I want to thank all the speakers and all of the audience and all of you who have spoken, all of you who have showed up. You know, um, this time of the year is a time for partying and drinking and eating and what have you. But I'm glad that at least in this room, I count maybe around 100 folks who showed up with that interest and with that compassion for our fellow human beings. And that is what migrant rights are about. Compassion for your fellow human beings. Recognizing that where they come from, they deserve a fair deal and justice. And with that, you know, I'd like to thank everyone for coming, all the speakers for, for being here. And thank you and good night. Thank you, everyone.